Southeastern High Speed is one of three default routes that you got with the Train Sim World 3 package, although it wasn't new to TSW as it had originally been released in February 2021. I briefly touched on this route when I made my original TSW 3 review soon after that game was released, but now that the Class 700 has finally joined the flock, I wanted to take a more in-depth look into SCHS. The route is decently non-linear, which is an annoyingly rare thing in TSW. You get the London St Pancras to Ashford International section of High Speed 1, as well as part of the older third rail lines through Kent, specifically Dartford to Faversham, with the North Kent line meeting the Chatham main line between Strood and Rochester. The route is set in the late 2010s, as it includes the rebuilt Gravesend Station, New Rochester Station, and additional bay platform at Raynham. Total route length is an admirable 89 miles, or 143 kilometers, and the timetable is based on the real May 2019 schedule. However, this is a remake of the original London to Faversham route in TS Classic. That one was originally released in 2013, and it was very linear compared to the new TSW version, but at least the TS Classic one actually included the Sheerness branch. Since that original release, the TS Classic route has seen extensions to Ramsgate, Dover Priory, and London Victoria via Bromley South, not to mention the Medway Valley and Catford Loop lines as well. What we've currently got in TSW is extended from the original 2021 release, but it's still a much smaller network than what we've got in TS Classic. Shifting the subject over to motive power, this route only includes three trains from the southeastern fleet, namely the Class 375-9 Electrostar, Class 395 Javelin, and a Class 465-9 Networker Electric Multiple Units. Interestingly, the 465 wasn't bundled with the original route, initially being released as a separately sold add-on in March 2021. As good as the 465 is, there is a glaring issue with that side of the add-on that I'll mention later. The Class 395 Javelin is the high-speed unit, with 29 of these 6-car EMUs being built by Hitachi of Japan. They have been in service since 2009, and are capable of running on both 750V DC third rail and 25kV AC overhead wires, but HS1 is the only OHLE section they run on. As for signalling systems, these things are compatible with both TVM430 and AWS, used on HS1 and the Classic lines respectively. Thameslink services were absent from the route for quite some time but Dovetail finally released the Class 700 as a separately sold add-on in July 2023. But at 25 New Zealand dollars, it is too expensive for what you get. The 700s were built by Siemens in Germany, first entering service in 2016 to replace the older Class 319s. Thameslink also had 23 Class 377-5s and 32 Class 387 stroke 1s, but these have all been transferred to Southeastern and Great Northern respectively. In TSW, the 700 appears on prototypical Raynham to Luton services, which you can only drive as far north as Dartford but they do allow you to stop at more stations north of Gravesend that are often skipped by southeastern trains. But there is an elephant in the room, because this add-on only includes the 8-car 700-0 variant, as there were apparently memory issues preventing the 12-car 700-1 from being added to the Brighton mainline, because of course there were. The 700 comes with an impressive 7 scenarios, 
instead of the usual three, and adds around 80 new services to timetable mode. And I'll also give Dovetail credit for supplying a well-detailed manual with this train, something I wasn't expecting them to do. Curiously, although you'll only be using the 700 on the third rail lines in-game if you just want to be prototypical, Dovetail still simulated AC overhead wire functionality, in case people want to use this on routes with overhead electrification. This is despite the fact that we don't have the Farringdon to Bedford section in TSW, or any other areas where 700s run under the wires, for that matter. All the more reason why Dovetail needed to make London to Peterborough instead of the dull Peterborough to Doncaster section. One of the included scenarios, called Desiro City Shattered, is very unusual because it involves running two 700s coupled together as a 16 car train, with one of the units being faulty and in need of assistance. You have to take the longer than normal train from Gravesend to the original Rochester station, where you'll uncouple the rear unit and continue to Gillingham Depot. In real life, Neither the 12 nor 8 car 700s are coupled together in passenger service, because the maximum length for a passenger train in the UK is only 12 coaches. The sounds are decent, as far as I'm concerned. Curiously, the horn sound is identical to the one used in Armstrong Powerhouse's Class 700 Enhancement Pack in TS Classic. The units still have the distinctive UFO-esque motor sounds when they're on third rail DC power, but apparently the sounds were not recorded from a 700, but rather a class 350. This has soured my view of what is otherwise a good unit. Appearance-wise, the 700 is very well modelled, and looks a damn sight better than the original TS Classic version. But at least the original one actually included the 12-car variant. She's quite a contrast to the older EMUs we have in the game, especially the Class 483. The interior looks accurate as well, although this is coming from someone that only saw the 700's interior through real footage elsewhere on YouTube. I can see why they're called ironing board seats, and I've heard that these are infamous in real life for their horribly uncomfortable design. And I can believe that despite never having ridden on a real Class 700. They look like the seats on the Gatwick Express Class 387. And what is it with modern British trains and always having rubbish seats? Anyone would think the DFT is completely out of touch and has no regard for passenger comfort. All the colours on the inside and outside of the 700 look right, and there's even this little bit of extra detail with a fire extinguisher under some seats. In my opinion, the 700 is one of the most well-detailed electric multiple units in TSW, on par with the 1972 stock and a class 484. The functionality of this unit is also impressive, in the sense that there are more clickable buttons and working screens in the cab, further improvements on the TS Classic version. And by the way, the RLU lettering on that label in the dashboard is short for Reduced Length Unit. In the 12 car 700 stroke ones, it actually says FLU, or Full Length Unit. Another little detail that I like is the voice you hear when you reset the driver reminder appliance, as demonstrated here. Driver, you have reset the DRA. Please check the signal. You also get a working train management system screen, just like the Scotrail Class 385, although, for whatever reason, 
the 700 hasn't got working announcements. That's approaching Armstrong Powerhouse levels of inconsistency. If anyone remembers the quality difference between the Class 37 packs and the 465 or 455 enhancement packs. But overall, the Class 700 in TSW isn't all that bad, and I see that the devs had a decent amount of respect for the source material. Now if only they could put in the same amount of effort for every single locomotive and multiple units they make for the game, especially the American and Canadian motive power, assuming they ever make another Canadian route. Newfoundland Railway, please. One last thing relating to Desiro Cities. I wouldn't mind seeing the Southeastern Class 707 added to this route, given that they sometimes run the Charing Cross to Gravesend services in real life. Although that would require the implementation of a new timetable, because the 707s didn't start running with Southeastern until well after 2019. But I just hope that, if Dovetail ever does make a 707, they won't just pull an Armstrong powerhouse by reskinning the existing 700 model, not even bothering to change the interior to make it accurate, and are just reducing the units to five coaches. I thought the Class 465 was another one of the better EMUs in TSW. For starters, the iconic motor sound that you get from these Metro Camel networkers is accurately represented, and the unit is very well modelled. On that front, I quite like the cab, especially since it's not just the flipping 365 model transplanted onto the 465, which is what Armstrong Powerhouse did when they made their 465 enhancement packs in TS Classic. And this is what a 465 cab is supposed to look like, complete with that clock and no buttons to control a pantograph. While route extensions are something I usually appreciate, and the extension to Dartford provides a longer section on which to run the class 465, it doesn't change the fact that Dovetail only provided one variant of this class. Specifically the 465-9, which are former 465-2s that were refurbished with a laughably bad attempt at a first class section. I've never understood why we've only got one variant of the 465 in TSW. And at least we've got basic renditions of all four subclasses in TS Classic, as bad as those models are. Dovetail should have added, at the very least, the original 465-2 as well. Or better yet, the 465-0 and 465-1 with Hitachi motors, as, although it may not have sounded all that accurate, they could have just reused the motor sounds from the 395. And don't even get me started on the lack of a class 466 as well. Speaking of a lack of variants, Dovetail only included one variant of the Class 375 Electrostar, when there are actually five in real life. This is the 375-9, which has questionable 3x2 seating throughout the entire 4 car unit, except for the first class area. I suspect that this is just the existing 377 model altered to look like a 375, given the lack of external CCTV cameras and accurate cab textures, etc. But it's still annoying that they didn't, at the very least, add the 375-8 as well. This variant has the same larger headlights as the 375-9, albeit with a more sensible 2x2 seating layout. Personally, the one variant I would have preferred to see added alongside the 375-9 is the 375-7 which has the small headlights typical of older Electrostars. There's also the 375-6, which has a largely pointless dual voltage function, and the 375-3, which only has three coaches instead of the usual four. I don't expect Dovetail to make all five variants of the 375, but I want them to at least give us one more variant to make the rail scene just that little bit more realistic.
They could have improved the situation when they brought out the Euro Phoenix Class 37 in early 2023. But instead of doing the sensible thing and including more variants, Dovetail chose a lazy cop-out and only bothered to make a southeastern white reskin for the existing 375-9. The 375 suffers from the same problem as the Southern Class 377-4 and Gatwick Express Class 387-2 that come with the London to Brighton route, in that the driver's view camera is set too far forward with no option to adjust the field of view. This makes the cab feel very cramped, and even the Class 385's cab feels more spacious than the 375, despite the fact that I initially felt like I was getting tunnel vision from that tiny windscreen. Despite the welcome extensions to Dartford and Ashford, Dovetail left out the branch to Sheerness on Sea because... <coughs> so that's the reason why they ignored the Isle of Sheppey. This is despite the fact that the branch was present on the original London to Faversham route in TS Classic, and it's not even 10 miles long, so it couldn't possibly have been too much extra effort to include it in TSW. Instead of adding that short branch line, they just layered in the class 465-9 to represent Sheerness services at Sittingbourne, which is unrealistic because South Eastern didn't use 465s on this branch outside of the peak time services to and from London Victoria. Instead, they would normally use the two-car class 466 networkers, which were replaced by three-car class 375-3s in December 2019. I would appreciate it if Dovetail finally added to the Sheerness branch along with the Class 466, especially since they were able to add an additional branch line to Nachfolger Dresden after its initial release. 465-9s will also appear on Medway Valley services at Strood, spoiling the realism and further highlighting the need for the other three 465 variants to be added in TSW. It's quite unrealistic to only get 465 stroke 9s whenever you see a 465, because there are only 34 examples of that subclass in real life. In real life, Southeastern actually uses class 375 stroke 3s on the Medway Valley line, not the 465s. All the more reason why Dovetail should have added more variants of the 375. The scene at London St Pancras doesn't feel realistic at all especially without the Class 373 or 374 Eurostars, and it's not helped by the fact that the only part of the station you can explore on foot are Platforms 12, 13 and 14, from which the Class 395s depart. It's probably to try and hide the fact that there's basically no detail anywhere else in the station. But if you've got the Midland Mainline DLC that Skyhook made, you can also see the East Midlands HSTs coming and going from St Pancras which I suppose is better than nothing. Throughout the research that I was doing for this review, I noticed that the line side detail throughout the SEHS route is distractingly basic. On the High Speed 1 section, you do have the Dartford Crossing or Queen Elizabeth Bridge visible from just outside the last tunnel before Ebbsfleet, and I think that whole section from Ashford International to St Pancras looks decent. There's a submarine on the Strode side of the River Medway, as there should be, but on the other side of the river, there's the usual ugly and flat grass texture clearly visible from the track. There is absolutely no detail on the roundabout next to the Luton Arches, located between Chatham and Gillingham. Even looking on Google Street View, I could see that the TSW version looks nothing like its real-life counterpart. Considering that this route is local territory for Dovetail, they should have been able to do a better job on the scenery than this. Another example of bad scenery can be found on Station Road next to Northfleet Station, although the station model itself is done correctly. There is no detail on the street, apart from the basic road and buildings, and a vehicle service centre that's here in real life is completely missing while those houses are supposed to be atop a dry stone wall. 
The S car stop marker is in the wrong place for platform 2, meaning that you will have one set of doors beyond the platform if you try to stop next to the marker. Overall, I think Dovetail did a very poor job recreating Northfleet. Some of the grass and ballast textures are pretty bad between Northfleet and Gravesend, especially around the junction where that HS1 spur from Ebbsfleet joins the North Kent line. And further down the line, surrounding Strood Station, lots of the same building assets are just copied and pasted over and over again. And on that section from Gillingham to Raynham, there's even more large fields that only have a few trees dumped on a flat and undetailed grass texture. And if you go to the external view when you're in platform 0 at Raynham, you can clearly see more reused buildings, as well as the completely blank hills off in the distance. The scenery details, or even just the scenery closer to the track, on southeastern high speed is so bad that it could rival the Long Island Railroad, CN Oakville subdivision, or Dresden to Chemnitz routes. Driving the Class 395 is quite a bizarre experience. Firstly, speed is measured in kilometres per hour on high speed 1, while the third rail lines have it measured in miles per hour. You've also got the different signalling systems, the in-cab TVM430 and the conventional AWS, as well as the process of switching from overhead wires to third rail on platforms 5 and 6 at Ebbsfleet International. St Pancras to Faversham is easily one of the more unique services you can operate in this game. But it's a fairly long run, taking at least 1 hour and 11 minutes to complete. It's also worth mentioning that the 395 accelerates much faster on AC under the wires than she does on DC from a third rail, but I can't remember why this is the case. Driving the Class 375 Stroke 9 is a very similar experience to the 377 Stroke 4 and 387 Stroke 2, albeit with an awful horn and otherwise underwhelming sounds. For whatever reason, DTG have never updated this unit to have the same, or at least similar quality sounds, as the Class 377 Stroke 4 from London Commuter. Even with the cab windows closed, you can barely hear the combined throttle and brake lever as you go through the notches. You can also hear the door beeps as if you were standing out on the platform and right next to the train. Again, this is while the cab windows are still closed. In stark contrast to the 375, I actually enjoy driving the 465 despite the glaring lack of additional variants. The sounds are very good, ranging from the iconic traction motors to even the clunk of the throttle as you change notches. The unit handles decently well, with an unusually high acceleration rate for a train on direct current. You've also got the option of switching regenerative braking on or off as well as a working speed set function. I don't use the speed set myself because I find it a bit finicky, and it doesn't work unless you put the throttle in notch 4. Even though the speed limit on this route gets as high as 90 miles per hour, the 465 is limited to only 75. Despite the poor scenery detail, I still think Southeastern High Speed is one of the better UK routes in train sim world. With the combination of a non-linear route, varied motive power, especially now that the 700 is available, and lively rail scene, there's plenty of things to do. All this route needs now is the missing 375 and 465 variants, as well as the Sheerness branch and the class 466. Especially the Sheerness branch. <laughs> 